Hi there everyone, hope you are doing well and I welcome you to this pre-scene analysis video. I am hoping that you will find this video helpful because we have created it with a whole lot of time and effort and have made sure that we go that extra step to help you understand this pre-scene. So this pre-scene analysis is for the strategic case study exam in November 2021 and February 2022. We're going to be using the same pre-scene over two windows. The company that's been given to us, the name of the company is PixelWiz. And we will be happy to run you through part by part, word by word of this pre-scene analysis, giving you lots of hints, tips and tricks making sure that you can relate to your E3, P3 and F3 syllabus. Plus, you can remember stuff in a simple and easy way. So you'll be able to replicate it when you actually write our mock exams or you sit the final case study. The major goal or the final goal is to make sure you have good ideas which you can write good answers with. Now, before we begin with the pre-scene for any of our students, the first thing that we always do for our students is introduce them to the industry analysis. Now, if you guys have just had a brief look at the company that's been given to us, PixelWiz, you'll see that our company creates video games, makes video games. So we create and sell video games as the major source of revenue for our company. All of you might have heard about video games or played video games, but do you know the nitty gritties and the details about the video game industry? I don't really think so. So before we begin with the pre-scene, it's always good to have good background information or some, you know, I'll say opportunities or threats. So the major areas that this industry is focusing upon, the major trends of this industry before we start with the pre-scene and that is why we create an industry analysis for our students which we make available as part of our free mini course. Now the mini course is something that we have created for absolutely free for all of our students. As registered providers with SEMA, we want to make sure we help as many students as possible and that is why the free mini course has been created. I'll leave the link to the free mini course in the description below. You just have to click on it and you'll be able to register for the free mini course. The mini course is very valuable in your preparation because it's going to give you a personalized study plan. It's going to give you your e-pillar mind maps. It's going to give you I can statement explanations, blueprint explanations, the industry analysis, obviously. And it also gives you a free mock exams, which you can take and which will be marked professionally by us. So a whole lot of information is packed in the free mini course. Guess what? It's absolutely free. I've mentioned it twice already. So there is no harm in trying it out. And trust me, it's going to add a lot of value to your preparation. Link is in the description below. All you got to do is access it and you can start with the material on there as well. Side by side, I want to begin with this pre-scene analysis for you. So without wasting any time, let's begin. The first thing that we begin with is the introduction. The company given to us this time around is called PixelWiz. We already know that. We've already touched base on that when we did our industry analysis. If you haven't done our industry analysis yet, I would first ask you to do that and you know just be comfortable with the industry before we start with the actual pre-scene. So PixelWiz is a quoted company, meaning listed company listed on the stock exchange that creates and sells video games. So our job or why the company exists is to create and sell video games. Now, what I will do is because this is a specific case study exam that I'm studying for every single opportunity to understand the company better or to relate it to my E3, P3 and F3 syllabus, I'll take that opportunity so that we are able to understand our company a little bit better. So when they say quoted company, it simply tells me or simply takes me to my F3 syllabus 
where they speak about listing companies or listed companies. So just to keep in our mind, if you are a quoted company, there are advantages for the same, which means you have access to capital. You can raise money by issuing shares. You have better visibility since you're listed on the stock exchange and better liquidity options as well. Whereas the disadvantages are that once you become a listed company, there are very many enhanced reporting requirements, lots of government rules, regulations that we may we may have to follow. And if we don't follow them, there can be penalties, liabilities that come our way. So what I'm trying to do is because they told us Pixelways is a quoted company, I'll keep in my mind that yes, a quoted company has a couple benefits, couple, you know, problems or limitations. With that in mind, let's move forward. Now they're telling us that Pixelways generates revenue streams from its games in several different ways, which means when we offer our games to our customers, the revenue that we generate from them comes in varying ways or very many different ways. So this tells me that since the revenue is generated in different ways, the management and the corporate structure of the company will be key for our success because managing all of this is vital. You can offer a good product, but if you're not able to manage the back end stuff, that becomes a big issue for any company. As we move deeper into the pre-scene, we'll see what the management of the company is like, who's making the decisions and all of that. Also, as we move deeper into the company, we'll see the structure of the company as well. But this is something to keep an eye out for. This is something to keep in our mind. And that is why we point it out for you. Next, you are a senior manager in Pixelwiz's finance function. Now, you have been given the role or the job of a senior finance manager. What does a senior finance manager have to do according to SEMA? So according to SEMA, a senior finance manager looks at the long term strategic issues, which means deciding the direction of the company in the future. That's what you will be assisting with. So when you write your mock answers with us, your job will be revolving around giving strategic ideas, strategic issues. Your audience is going to be the board of directors. And to give a satisfactory answer, understanding the full scale of the business operation is very important and the pre-scene becomes a very vital document. That is why you will see that we go through all the minute details in the pre-scene as well. You report directly to the board and advice on special projects and strategic matters. So the word strategy, long term, all of this is coming up again and again. All of this is part of my E3 syllabus, strategy forming, long term decision making, stakeholder management, risk management. All of this is part of my E3 syllabus. And we already know that E3 is the most important pillar for your strategic case study exam. So at every opportunity, we'll try to link it back to our E3, P3 and F3 syllabus. Now, as we move on, they are telling me that Pixelwiz is based in a developed country that has an active and well-regulated stock exchange. And the fictional country that they have created is, of, is called rather Westland. So Pixelwiz is based in a fictional country called Westland and this country is developed, which means people in that country are going to have good disposable income, interest in technological advancements. So this clearly tells me that the demand conditions in that particular market are going to be strong and demand conditions this word or this phrase called demand conditions is part of your Porter's diamond, which is again part of my E3 syllabus. So I'm trying to link in important study models as well to help you understand our company better. So developed country, meaning people have the money, people have the power, people have the interest to buy innovative products. This is a good thing for you because Westland having a developed economy 
clearly tells me that people will be interested in products like video games. For a very simple example, if my company was based in a country that was not doing well or the country was going through economic crisis and, you know, very many issues, do you think their priority is going to be spending money on internet online games or any kind of video games? I don't think so. So being in a developed country is automatically a good competitive advantage for my company because of strong demand conditions. And that is what I have put in the two text boxes that you can see on screen as well. And we use lots of images to make your, to, to you know, enhance your memory as images fit in your memory better. Moving on, Westland's currency is the W dollars. And Westland requires companies to prepare their financial statements in accordance with the IFRS. Next, they move on to a separate subheading, which is called the video game industry. So they are now providing us with an industry analysis inside of the pre-scene itself. We have made our own industry analysis as an extra document that we make our students do before we start with the pre-scene because it gives you a good head start it gives you good ideas good trends opportunities to look at and then we bring you the to the pre-scene so that you can compare better but now as part of the pre-scene itself they've given you extra information under the industry analysis or the industry bracket so they, in the pre-scene, are explaining what the video game industry is like in this fictional scenario created by them. So video games takes many different forms. We already know that. All of us would have experienced some kind of video game, whether you've played it, your children have played it, or you've seen somebody play it. They comprise interactive software that enables players to view and control graphic images. So very clearly on the onset also I mentioned that this is an industry which will be technologically motivated and will have new enhancements every day. There is always new technology that people keep finding, new products that keep coming, new video game enhancements that are announced. So this tells me that the product life cycle has the possibility to be very short here. This brings in my E3 syllabus because every day there is a, there's something new, there's an upgrade. So why will somebody want to go for an old product when a new one, better one is available? So product life cycle is something that I have to think about in this industry, part of the E3 syllabus. Globally, there are approximately 2,500 companies employing approximately 70,000 people in the development of video games. This clearly brings about the competitive nature of the industry. It clearly tells you that there are many players in this industry and many people who are striving to make their company better. So competition is going to be the nature of this industry. These figures do not include the many companies that support the creation and sale of video games through the manufacture and sale of hardware and provision of operating systems and other softwares that supports gameplay. For example, you, a video game is probably a, a CD or something that you've downloaded online. But where can you actually play it? It's on hardware, right? like a computer, like a laptop, like any kind of game console. So video game industry is a very big industry. One part of that industry is people who make games. The other part of the industry is people who provide the hardware. And the third part of this industry who create operating systems and softwares that support the gameplay. So it's a very huge industry. Lots of players in this industry. Game developers generated revenue of approximately $170 billion in 2020 and the projected revenue for 2021 is $180 billion. You can see how huge the market is and also you can see that the market is growing. So this is further evidence to you of such a huge market which has opportunities to grow and innovate. Again, 
external market analysis will be important in this industry to see what competitors are doing to see what the market scenario is like to see how you can grow you can innovate and this is again part of your e3 syllabus now on your screen you'll see a graph that they have given us as part of the pre-scene itself in that graph it's very clearly seen that the global video games revenue is on the rise it's an industry that's been existing for a very long time but still it is exciting people and inviting new people and that is why the growth is strong in 2021 the growth is expected to reach 180 billion dollars in sale so it's a huge industry it is estimated that there are 2.7 billion video gamers worldwide of whom 55 percent are male so why are they telling us this it adds value because you know which market segment is likely to produce or, or you know which market segment you should be targeting so that you get maximum revenue from the same now i know that 55 percent of the buyers are male so when i make a game when i make a product i will make it in such a way that it entices the male market because it's a bigger market in terms of segmentation so they can look to buy my product also, I can look at the women market, I can look to grow my share in the children or the kids market, you know, because everybody is exposed to video games in one form or another. But this segmentation becomes better because you will be able to understand which segment to target. Should I make a game which males want to play? Should I make a game that women will be enticed towards? Or should I make a game that focuses on kids? And accordingly, I can look at the market and present my product. So customer segmentation and understanding the perspective of buyers is going to be key over here. The more market analysis you do and use technology to support your decisions, the better we can serve this market. This brings in the concept of data analytics and big data because you need to understand your customers. The better you understand them, the better you segment them, the better you can serve their needs and the better your company grows. The average age of gamers is 34 with a wide dispersion of player ages around that age. So over here, a lot of graphical representations, a lot of numbers will have to be looked upon to understand which game is falling into which perspective and what has the majority growth. Because at the end of the day, your business wants to grow. So a graph has been given for the segmentation by age as well. If you look at it, majority of the game players are between 18 and 35 then there is a pretty much equal distribution between 36 to 49 years lower than 18 years higher than 50 years but the major market seems to be between 18 to 35 so whenever you make a game this is what you want to look at like your customer segmentation your market segmentation part of e3 so this gives us a focus area and can help us develop better products with better growth opportunities. Focusing on segments and curating to their needs is a key competency for any company. Video gaming has existed in one form or another for decades, but the industry has changed constantly in response to developments in hardware and in software as well. So we know that this is going to be an ever-changing industry the nature is going to be ever changing it's going to be a fast moving industry and hence you need to plan and make your strategic decisions with greater care and that's your role as a senior finance manager and as a SEMA expert in this strategic case study exam so you will see that throughout this pre-scene analysis, we are going word by word. We are helping you understand everything step by step. And that's what we want you to follow as well. Do not miss anything because knowing the company well is very important. So we saw that in this industry, knowing the market and basing your decisions on 
market research will be very important because you'll have to segment you'll have to dissect you'll have to break down and then you'll have to understand this market with all the data that you've collected so if i've collected all of this data i've got to use it as well right if i don't use it to my advantage what's the point of this data this is a technologically based industry so let's use technology to understand my customers better and this brings in the opportunity of big data and data analysis in the gaming industry so this is supplementary reading this is something extra that we have created over here and presented to our students because when we find a topic that needs some more elaboration we provide it as supplementary reading in our pre-scene analysis this is not part of the pre-scene this is something extra that we have created as a supplementary document so big data in the gaming industry is becoming very common is becoming something that is a must use so the world of gaming has grown from a simple virtual tennis game in 1958 to offering an overwhelmingly large number of genres and sub genres it's become a very big industry we have reached a point where big data has arrived in the gaming scene and how is big data being used? First and foremost, it's being used as a, a tool to improve your game design, to make the game better. So similar to how retailers can collect customer data to personalize their products and services, big data science in gaming can help game development companies find out their players demographics their likes their dislikes and serve them better so this is something that's happening in the real world people are using big data to produce better games secondly big data in gaming versus the level of difficulty which means big data is being used to make games a little bit more challenging to make games a little bit more difficult so that people are enticed to play them so all of the data is collected from the game and then and then the game developers are actually finding out where the major bottlenecks are which means which levels are the players not able to pass they'll make it a little bit difficult they'll make it a little bit easy to make the game more enticing so just giving you an example of how data is being used you would have never imagined that data is being used in the gaming industry in this way so we are presenting this information to you so you understand this industry better big data is also being used to stop cheaters for example activision the main developer of the first person shooter game call of duty most of us would know it is one company that uses big data to improve their games they had to deal with the issue of boosting among their players in COD. Boosting refers to the attempt of increasing someone's gaming scores by unfair methods. So big data is being used to remove any cheating or any unfair you know, practices in the game as well. So big data has its very own benefits. Moving on, big data is also used to understand how game development companies can earn money. So another use of big data in the gaming industry is monetization. Game development companies need to earn money, especially for mobile games. The two main monetization methods used for in-app purchases and in-app advertisements. Big data in gaming optimizes both use cases. You understand where people are using the, uh, the gaming app the most. Where do you want to put the advertisement? Where do you want to put the app, uh, offer to make an in-app purchase? All of that can be controlled by data analysis. And big data is being used to keep players hooked. They want people to play games. Gaming companies want people to play games for more. So big data science in gaming can also be used to monetize the game like we already know. But it attempts to read the mind of players, figure out what players want, what do they actually, what does actually excite them when they're playing a game. All of that data is extracted and then you can use it to better serve your customers. 
so you may be thinking right now why are we doing this you know it's extra information there's so much information already out there why are we doing something extra the very logical answer is first of all we were given a hint in the pre scene itself that market analysis will be very important for us to cat you know categorize or do or market segmentation is going to be very important now how can you use this segmentation and the information that you have that can only be harnessed with the potential of data analysis or big data so as part of this industry analysis i'm simply trying to tell you that big data opportunities are great in this industry as we move deeper into the pre scene and start analyzing our company you know actually looking at pixel wiz we will see whether our company pixel wiz is using the full potential of big data or not but you will only be able to do that because i gave you this idea right now because we did this supplementary reading part right now so everything that is being done is for a reason is to give you good ideas to keep with yourself after finishing this supplementary reading part let's go back to the pre scene and i've made a clear indication that the pre scene stuff begins again over here so in this section they're telling us the video game revenues by type of device so which devices are most popular which devices are most used that is what we'll look at if you look at the graph first and foremost the graph clearly tells us that the smartphone market is the largest after the smartphone market comes the game consoles then the laptops then your handheld consoles then your vr then your tablet then your smart tv it's very clearly visible from this pie chart that they have given us this tells me that the smartphone market is the one that is growing the most and even if you look at our logo the pixel wiz logo you'll see that it's pretty much like a smartphone itself so as we move deeper into the pre scene what we will understand is when we actually start speaking about our company what we'll understand is what our company offers its games in what are the different methods that our games are offered in are we a game or a video game manufacturer or creator who makes games for smartphones who make games for game consoles who makes vr games we don't know that yet right now we are only doing the industry analysis in the industry analysis i know that the smartphone market is the biggest that's what i can see clearly over here so let's begin one by one we'll do each type of device that they have given us one by one and we'll pick up ideas from there so when we actually speak about our company we can suggest and we can have in mind what are the biggest markets because growing markets that's what they have presented us over here so that is something that we'll focus upon firstly we are speaking about game consoles now game consoles are devices that are designed to play games in the home everybody pretty much would have seen a console they are usually connected to a television screen or a monitor games are loaded from physical media such as cartridges or dvd rom or they can be downloaded off the internet as well console manufacturers often design their machines so that they can connect to the manufacturer's own website that can simplify the process of downloading and installing software created by companies such as pixel waves for a very simple example if you've seen a ps4 the playstation or an xbox it is directly linked to the ps uh, you know the playstation itinerary where you can buy your games from where you can buy those softwares from where you have access to them the gallery where you can actually purchase the games that companies such as pixel wiz have made that's a game console a good relationship with game console manufacturers will be of importance they are important stakeholders because if the actual console is not good enough who's going to play your game so your relationship with them will have to be good and hence they become a stakeholder so stakeholder management relationship management is very important which is part again of your e3 syllabus 
see how these things you would not have noticed if you don't do your pre-scene analysis with somebody who is an expert who knows their job so that is why we go through step by step we don't miss out on anything next we speak about handheld consoles that you can hold in your hand and play so handheld consoles are self-contained units that have integrated screens and are battery powered which means that they can be played without having to connect to a screen or any other device games can be downloaded from cartridges or you can download it from the internet handheld consoles are portable so they can be used while traveling as well so right now they're only giving us the type of device in which games are played third we are speaking about virtual reality or augmented reality so vr is a major area of growth in the video game in our pie chart we saw that it's a small market share right now but over here they're telling us that it's a major area of growth it's a growth opportunity in a home setting virtual reality requires players to wear headsets that contain screens that replicate the eyes binocular vision to create a sense of depth it's kind of something that you wear on your eyes the picture is right in front of you some of you may have tried a vr gaming system already sensors in the headset detect head movements and that is fed back through the screens so that the player feels immersed in the virtual world that is created the augmented reality is the technology which takes input from cameras incorporated into the headset and combines that with virtual images so that the players see both simultaneously that could for example create the impression that there is an exotic board bird sorry which is hovering in the player's living room that is possible or you are on a roller coaster ride all of those things can be created because of virtual reality and the technology of augmented reality vr headsets are generally used in conjunction with other gaming devices such as pcs or consoles as you can see in the image the vr device is worn on the eye but in your hand to play you may need a console or a keyboard so it's used in conjunction very upcoming sector of the market being promoted by many companies all around the world it adds to the growth prospect of the market and it's an opportunity for our company as well to maybe invest in this growing market the next type of gaming device that we can look at is a very conventional one which is pc or a laptop that everybody has been using since a very long time video games are essentially just software and so many games are written for conventional computers those games are generally downloadable from the internet or you have a cd that you put in your dvd rom video games generally require significant amounts of processing powers and serious gamers often invest heavily in powerful graphic cards or powerful processors because they want to play those uh, you know very demanding games that require a strong processor we pretty much know this the next gaming device is a tablet a smartphone or a smart tv many consumer devices have sufficient processing power to offer gameplay players can download their games onto their phones tablets and smart televisions because everything is connected to the internet this we know is the largest market share from that pie chart that we just saw because everybody has access to a phone a tablet so you are able to quickly download these games easily and it's a method of recreation those will not offer the same processing power as a console or a pc but they're still convenient so overall i will say that positioning and understanding the market and then delivering to your market is vital you pick what you want to do for example do you want to game make games for smartphones fine serve that market it's a big market do you want to be a pc laptop or a console making a, a console game making company fine do that you can diversify as well which means you can look at different markets as well but position yourself currently understand your market currently which you can do it you can do with the help of data analysis as well as market analysis 
both part of your E3 syllabus. And when we move to our company analysis, when we start speaking about PixelWiz deeper into the pre-scene, we'll see which market does PixelWiz really look at? What does it see? What does it serve as of now? Next, development in the video game industry has been driven largely by improvements in the hardware devices that are available to gamers. So hardware devices have become better. So people are more interested now. Games have automatically become better. We know it's a connected demand. They are important stakeholders for us. For example, improvements in the graphic processors used in PCs and consoles have encouraged game developers to create games that make full use of their processing power. And it really engages the customers. So connected demand is going to be a feature of this industry, which we already spoke about. Many video games require players to have access to websites through which the players can access their accounts and on which they can play games. So these are online available as well. Those websites are generally cloud-based. They store your data on a cloud. The introduction of cloud-based gaming is a relatively recent development that is expected to be a huge growth potential in this market. Possibilities in this market do seem endless in terms of the innovative nature of the products or services which are being offered. Every day something new is coming up. So when we go on to speak about our company, we will see if we are offering these cloud-based services, cloud-based gaming as well. We'll see at a later stage Right now, it's only the industry analysis. So websites can be provided by hardware manufacturers, particularly those who make consoles, by companies who create and sell software, or by standalone companies who provide this facility as a commercial service. The providers of these websites will collect any payments that are due from the players for their gameplay. There are various ways in which revenues can be generated from these games. And as we already know, for any gaming company, there are many different ways in which revenues can be gained. And this is something that you really need to look at to make sure you're not losing out on any opportunity. Now to the next section where they're telling me the different type of PC-based games and console-based games that are available. So until now, we were doing the different gaming devices. Now we are doing the different types of games. The first type of game that I will look at is downloads and boxed games. This is under my, this is available in PC games as well and in consoles as well. This requires the player to pay to download the software or to purchase it on a physical medium such as a DVD-ROM or a CD-ROM. The payment entitles the player to run the game and may also grant access to some online features. This is what is most common. You buy a game or you download a game and then you pay for it. This is what is most common in any, you know, pretty much everybody may have done this once if they are a game player. Second, there are pay to play games. This requires players to pay a relatively small amount each time they wish to log in and play, or they must make a monthly subscription. These are generally PC-based games. They are generally available in a PC-based scenario. Thirdly, there are cloud gaming options. Cloud gaming options are also available in PC-based games mainly. And their share is very small, but it's a really fast growing sector or a segment. So cloud gaming is essentially a form to pay to play that has recently been introduced by some game companies. Gamers pay a monthly fee that entitles them to play a selection of game offered by that company. These games are played over the internet and are streamed to the gamers devices. So all of this, this cloud computing and cloud gaming system means that any company that offers this kind of service has to take care of, you know, customer data, you know, like confidential information, personal information that customers input when they're paying. So data protection, digital 
data safety, digital threats is what you may have to think about. And this becomes part of your P3 syllabus. Our systems must be protected from any cybersecurity issues. So as we move deeper into the pre-scene and we try to figure out what our company does or is doing, if we are looking at the cloud gaming system or any system where you are, you know, you are just having access to customers' private data, confidential data, then this digital threats and digital aspect must be kept in mind which is your p3 syllabus next category is free to play games which are absolutely free most of us may have experienced them sometime you download it start playing this can be downloaded or run directly from a website the player must register and is given the opportunity to make in-game purchases how do they make money they offer you in-game purchases more lives or you know some more coins that you can play with or whatever that is what they ask you to pay for because at the end of the day it's a business many of these games restrict gamers ability to play effectively unless they purchase extra tokens or extra whatever they are offering the monetary cost of these purchases is generally only a few cents per item but purchasing opportunities are frequent and come throughout the game that's how they earn their money Next category is social games that are available through social networks. They're often paid for by advertisers who can develop games that promote their brands and products. For example, I come up with a game that promotes my brand. Those are called social games. Those are also available. So we now looked at two different uh, markets, I will say, which was first the gaming devices market and now we, were, we are looking at a segmentation of the type of games market that are present in the PC-based games and console-based games. For me to understand which holds the market share, which holds the largest market share or the lowest market share and which is coming up. That is what we understood from this segmentation. Something that they are mentioning which is very important from our E3, P3 and F3 perspective is that most games that are free to play require the entry of a valid credit card number that is partly to ensure that the game account is being used by an adult even if the intention is to create an account for the child's use which means it may be a game that is only suitable for adults but children are using it in any case which is not the right approach so this is a risk which is present and it could be something that puts your entire company at jeopardy because let's say it's an adult game or it's meant for adults and a child gain, gains access to that game he learns something which he shouldn't he gets inspired by something that he shouldn't and if it comes out that it actually happened because of your game it turns out to be a big reputational issue. So this is something for us to keep into mind the customer segmentation, the validity of the user. And this is something that the entire gaming industry is really dealing with in today's world. But it's a risk. So identifying risks is an important aspect or important job in your case study exam. You must make sure that at every stage, you try to identify risks that the market faces or risks that your company faces so that you can suggest better risk management. You can suggest better areas of risk identification. So from the very beginning, when you're doing this pre-scene analysis with me, try to have a sheet where you're listing down the risks that your company could face. Because this is part of your P3 syllabus and identifying risks and managing those risks is, yes, an important aspect of this case study exam. So telling you from the very beginning, it may be possible for players to charge the cost of upgrades or enhan enhancements to the card. Game companies set out the terms under which the credit cards can be charged in a license agreement that must be accepted. When you, when you, you know, generally register for a game, there is a whole list of points that most of us don't ever read. Just click the button and move on. But that is all the policies 
and that is something which you as a game developer should be very clear about should be very transparent in because you don't want to cheat your customers right you don't want to charge them when they are unaware of something so risk management again in this segment making sure that there are no legal risks making sure there are no legal issues and making sure the customer is happy when he plays your game something for us to keep in mind game accounts can often take automatic payments from credit cards unless that facility has been disabled by the credit card holder like i mentioned earlier protection of the data will be important and this brings in our data protection topics from the p3 syllabus next subsection that we are speaking about is developing video games remember still we are only speaking about the industry we have not started to speak about our company which is pixelwiz only a detailed industry analysis section that they have given is what we are going through so there are many different types of games reflecting the interests of different players and the capability and limitations of their preferred devices for gameplay so from here on there is going to be standard gaming types that are being described here which most of it's just standard different types of games which are available in the market it's just an overview that they're trying to give you so first there are puzzle games these games involve an intellectual challenge with no need for quick reaction they may be computerized versions of traditional board or card games for example your chess or checkers or solitaire whatever second there is action games now these take many different forms but they are characterized by the fact that they involve a physical challenge and you need hand eye coordination these games can be you know actual action games where you have to you know cross a bridge or you know make certain complete certain tasks or you lose a life stuff like that then there are platform games which involve a entire fantasy character or an entire fantasy scenario that actually can is created so that you can play on in it for example the character might have to jump over trip wires or duck to avoid lightning bolts stuff like this is part of action games under the action games section itself there are sometimes simulation games so simulating a challenge set in a realistic virtual world as seen through the character's eyes for example a player might see a patch of jungle from the point of view of a soldier who must carry out a patrol without being seen by the enemy or the troops these are just action games then there are actual simulation games so this gameplay puts the player in control of a vehicle or another item for example a flight simulator or a car simulator the software would then offer a very similar experience or to driving a car for its for instance a more powerful car accelerating faster some simulators offer an almost cinematic representation of the setting for example a ship simulator might offer a very detailed view of a wharf as if it would have been you know actually in real it's so realistic Hardware manufacturers sell a wide range of peripherals that can be plugged into the computer or consoles to assist. For example, there can be special headphones, or there can be a special uh, a simulator joystick, or you know, the hardware manufacturers sell stuff like this to make your simulation experience even better. So up until now, we learned about puzzle games, action games, and simulation games. With that, we have come to the end of part. one of our pre scene analysis so this part only gave you a hint of how our pre scene analysis works and we did the first section of the pre scene as well where we introduced the company a little bit to you and we did the industry analysis in details in the second part we go on to actually speaking about our company because that is covered in the pre scene there so that is what we'll be speaking about in the second part and then we'll be moving on to a full detailed financial analysis as well which will look at each and every aspect of the financial statements that are given in the pre scene making sure that we do not miss out on anything and we understand each part of the company because that is key 
to writing a good answer when we actually start with mock questions. Hope you found this helpful. Be very comfortable and very clear with part one before you move on to the next step.